So, we have seen what Ashwapati spoke last time and he defined fate, perhaps the blindness of our will is fate, blindness of our will is fate. In a certain sense, this is a contextual definition of fate. He's speaking something and in that context, that is how he's speaking. And therefore, you have perhaps seen. He said, and Narad answered, not the king. Well, this is a very puzzling kind of statement. <laughs> I mean, from the point of view of English, it is perfect, absolutely. But it is also uh, some other connotation. In the sense that whatever Ashwabhati had to say, he had said. He saw the shadow, he saw the light blazing and all that kind of thing. And he said, singer of ultimate ecstasy, all those things he saw. And then he said, then he said and Narad answered not. In fact, that should have been just enough. But he says, not the king. See, I mean, politically he has to adjust somehow. Not the king uh, is important because he need not answer to the king. The king knows already. Ashwapati, the yogi, he has already seen and Narada has recognized that he got the whole thing straight away. So, he did not really answer the king. So, if at all he has to answer, he has to answer to somebody else. And that is what will follow, the queen. <coughs> this is what will follow. Not the king. What is it? He said and Naral answered the queen. I mean, that is what it should mean in the plain language, you see, in the context you receive. Or maybe perhaps Savitri, you see. But not the king is a very significant phrase from that angle. Because he need not answer him. He has seen it by his vision and all that thing. So the question of answer doesn't arise there, you see. It would have become too common, too worldly, you see, for him, you see. And therefore, you have got this, but. Nara is keeping quiet, therefore, but. Now the queen alarm lifted her voice. She cannot keep quiet now. After seeing all those things there, <laughs> after seeing the ominous features of what was happening between Narada and Rashwapati and all that, and the way Savitri was speaking in the team, she could not resist. She could not stop. The mother in her came out in a very strong, passionate way. She has to come out as the mother. And therefore, she says, but now uh, at the beginning, of course, she says that, well, perhaps there is nothing difficult, nothing. She has not seen the shadow which Ashwapati saw. Ashwapati saw the shadow over the name and it was chased by a stupendous light. She has not seen that. She is a worldly woman, you see, that way. She worldly, although, of course, she says, although the queen of Yogi Ashwapati, she is also the wife of a yogi, you see. So, she has certain qualities. But here, what has come out most prominently is the human aspect of the mother in a very forceful way, you see. And therefore, but now the queen, alarmed, obviously she is alarmed, lifted a voice, lifted means she is very strong, <coughs> persuasive. This cannot be. I will not accept what you are seeing, you see. She is kind of challenging it also, you see, lifted her voice. See, what beautiful usage of words, perfect, you see. Oh, seer, the bright arrival has been time to this high moment of a happy life. That is what she will see, obviously. Bright arrival, this high moment of a happy life. Obviously, Savitri was in search of a husband, life partner. She has come back 
it means she has found one and therefore it is a happy moment for the whole family yes sabhi has found somebody definitely it is a happy moment of life hi moment of happy life thing will happen now from this onward but then she also says a very beautiful thing thy bright arrival that is a very significant phrase you have come here it means that it is so well time something is expected to happen something bright i expect not something ominous something fateful something disastrous something blemished but something which will matching with the happy life which is to begin and therefore she is anticipating that happiness in the arrival of narad and therefore it is a bright happiness what a perfect adjective is used bright you see narad is opposed by himself a glowing person a celestial being coming in his shining appearance and all that but his appearance here is a bright arrival it is matching with the entire sequence of event then let the speech be nine of grief despair because yours is a happy arrival i expect something benign and should be without grief you are coming from a only place grief despair confirm this blight conjunction of two stars and sanction joy with a celestial voice sanction joy with a celestial voice she is asking for the blessings from narad the heavenly blessings for the union of stevan and savitri she is obviously she is asking for and therefore for her it is a happy moment also you see that he has come they have come all that kind of a thing you see confirm savitri has chosen this one maybe this man is living in the forest in the wilderness he doesn't have a crown on his head it doesn't matter still i accept that because it is savitri's choice and therefore you should be light conjunction of two stars the two stars have come together and let them unite sanction now she says sanction it is not in fact even in the power of narad to sanction he can tell certain things it is not in his power but for her as a human he is too great too high in his station and all that and therefore whatever word comes from him is a sanction may not be his sanction but he will bring some other heavenly sanction for the blight conjunction of the two stars he will bring that thing you see that what the word sanction sanction joy with celestial voice he was singing the song of love to the royal parents for one hour before the arrival of uh, savitri in the palace and it was the love song he was singing and therefore that celestial voice is carrying the sweetness with that celestial voice say tathastu say let it be so i have my blessings for this marriage that is what she is expecting from narad but of course the story will tell you that he has many other things to tell in the story of mahabharat the original story of savitri in the mahabharat the moment savitri says that she has found such a man as her future husband in the forest he says at once narad he doesn't go through all these things vyasa he says aho bahut mahat papam it is a great blemished thing that is what he says immediately narad the moment savitri tells that she has found such a man as a future husband aho bahut mahat papam mahat big papam sinful blemished faulty he says defective he says immediately he says narad but here is she is anticipating blight sanction blight sanction of joy from narasimha not that what vyasa said here is 
here drag not in the peril of our thoughts let not our words create the doom they fear yes that is what we are made of even the happy moment of life we think of evil possibility our mind becomes restless sometimes will this happen will that happen will it be an accident will it be all kind of silly thoughts come to our mind you see and therefore he says let not our words create the doom they fear normally this is what happens in our life here drag not the peril our thoughts are all will this happen will it be a happy marriage will they live together happily all kind of things keep on happening in our mind let them not come into our mind at all he says let not our words create the doom they fear in our words normally in our daily life it is our thought which creates the doom we invite the evil we invite the doom we anticipate this will happen and that is enough for the doom to walk in our anticipation so we have to be very careful in our thoughts daily life you see our words create the doom we have to be very careful about that thing why always in us think positively think in the good sense think that whatever is going to happen will be auspicious noble elevating acceptable always think that in fact that is what happens normally it is a mental formation which takes a concrete shape and presents itself to us in the form of good or bad or evil or whatever it is so she says words create a doom they fear so in other words this lady is also a great psychologist the human psychology she understands very well the depth of psychology you see she is a very mature person she has lived a rich life and in the richness of that life she understands all these things you see that it is thought which creates good and bad here is no cause for dread no chance for grief to raise her ominous head and stare at love this is the positive thinking she expected them to happen to raise her own mana said no it cannot happen grief will not raise her head there is no cause for it no chance for grief to raise her her that stands for grief grief is feminine her own said and stare at love a single spirit in a multitude happy is such a man mid earthly men whom savitri has chosen for her mate and fortunate the forest hermitages they are living her palace and riches and a throne my savitri will dwell and bring in heaven that is the positive way of thinking is it <laughs> and she says satyavan he is living in the forest he is an exiled prince it doesn't matter but he is happy there he is happy because my savitri has chosen him he has become happy to her because she has chosen him a single spirit in a multitude now this is of course a kind of an overstatement also <laughs> <laughs> in the sense, but still it is justified in the sense that savitri was moving from place to place for a long long time she did not find anybody 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 at all anywhere so in kings princes prince all of them came forward but she was not she therefore he is a single spirit in a multitude she doesn't know the qualities of satyavan which savitri had immediately recognized in him at the very first sight she knew who satyavan was it is not that this queen is able to see here but 
in the mature human way she is saying yes he must be a very happy person because my savitri has chosen him my savitri will not do something wrong she has something in her which will prompt her always to do the right thing and therefore he is happy happy is such a one mid earthly men whom savitri has chosen for her mate and fortunate the forest hermitage yes the whole place is now very beautiful very happy hermitage yes they are living the hermitage not in the palace it doesn't matter it is very happy in seeing they are living their palace and riches and a throne see <laughs> that is how she is describing contrast she is going from the palace to the hermitage she is be going there to see she is describing it. yet she is happy she has considered psychologically what savitri has chosen a normally she would kind of express something of an equal stature it is not there they are living in their palace and riches and a throw my savitri now this is important my savitri will dwell then bring in heaven yes this is what i know of my savitri wherever she will go there she will bring down heaven that is what i know of my savitri she is of course at the same time very possessive of her daughter she is possessing of her daughter my savitri <laughs> dwell and bring in heaven then let thy blessing put the immortals to seal on the bright lives and stained felicity pushing the ominous shadow from their days now she is of course seeking blessings from narad the sanction in that sense basically it is not narad who is going to sanction it but his word yes all right go ahead savitri has chosen go ahead that word itself is a sanction for her and that is the blessing that is the blessing put this i mark it will put this seal of the gods themselves a mortal seal on the bright lives unstained felicity pushing the ominous shadow pushing the ominous shadow now of course the queen has not seen the shadow ashwapati saw the shadow she has not seen the shadow but she is speaking of the shadow and she says in the next sentence too heavy falls a shadow on man's heart now this shadow she is speaking now in the context of this line she has not seen the shadow herself as her husband has seen but she know that in the world even if there are very good things happening everything is moving smoothly and all that still some disasters happen some unfortunate things do occur and therefore heavy falls a shadow that is the way in which the life is here around we live that kind of life here. so in that sense it is possible that there is an ominous shadow in the way of the coming together so it is it is this sentence which rather tells you what that ominous shadow is it is not her vision but it is out of her life experience that she is saying or the ominous shadow is saying it dares not be too happy upon her well this is what happens here you see you cannot be too happy suddenly some disaster happens some miserable calamity happens and then all is gone you see it dreads the blow dogging two vivid joys a lash unseen in face extended hand my god so there is a lash the spirit has extended his hand he could whip it to see <laughs> a lash unseen in face extended hand the danger lurking in fortune's foul extreme 
and RNA and life's intelligent smile and trembles at the latter of the gods. Danger lurking in fortune's proud extremes. Well, we live happily, merrily. We are totally ignorant, totally unconscious of what is going to happen next moment. And therefore, in our indulgent smile, there is the irony of life. We enjoy parties, we enjoy company, we enjoy life, all the occasions and all that thing. We indulge in that, but behind that, there is the irony of life also. We bring something unfortunate and therefore, and trembles in the laughter of the gods, <coughs> laughter of the gods. Life trembles in the laughter of the gods because of that, you see. And laughter of the gods, that is a Homeric phrase. Homer uses that phrase in the Iliad, right in the beginning, when there is the assembly of the gods, and then they're having a good party or whatever you want to call it, then comes Hephaestus limping with his one foot. He is a lame man, lame god, Hephaestus. He is a lame god. And then all the gods are laughing. This lame fellow has come as he looked there, you see. <laughs> so this laugh of the gods is, is actually the echo of that phrase. There is something lame also in life here. And the gods laugh at that, you see. And irony in life, indulgent smile, and tremble into the laughter of the god. Normally, the Indian gods don't laugh. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah. They don't have company like that. They don't have parties like that, you see. <laughs> yeah, but then they are maybe humorous, but not as if, as if all the gods coming together in assembly and then talking and exchanging uh, uh, pleasantries and all that. No. <laughs> It happens in the Greek drama only, Greek, uh, Greek uh, epic, you see. <laughs> Laughter the god. On the Olympian uh, heights, all the gods assemble together and then they have a merry party, you see. <laughs> yeah. And trembles at the laughter of the god.